10 minutes to make presentation. Alright, good morning, my esteemed opponent, judges, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tini from NUS High School, and today I'll be presenting a question for magnetic trade. So we can first see from the question statement that we are supposed to attach magnets to both ends of a battery and to place this train inside a wire coil. And this train will then move and will investigate its speed and power. So the relevant parameters to this question will involve the physical parameters of the wire coil, such as the turn density, the coil radius, and the wire radius, and also of the train itself, for instance the number of magnets and the battery voltage. So I'll first go through my experiments, and then I'll move on to a theoretical account to explain this phenomenon. Finally, I'll compare my results between my theory and my experiments in a time domain study and a steady state study, and then I'll move on to further insight on curved wire coils and closed loops. So let's see my experiments. Well, we can see here that we've chosen to place our wire coil in between two straight lines to keep our coil straight, and we have 11 magnetic field sensors placed into an array to, to detect the magnetic field of our train as it passes by in the wire coil. We also have multimeters to measure the battery voltage at the start of each run. Now we make our coils out of LR1 1.5 volt alkaline batteries, and we use centrical neodymium magnets uh, for both ends of the train. And to release our train, we use a motorized mechanism to withdraw a piece of insulating tape from beneath our train, as shown. And this ensures that our train is launched with no initial velocity. And to track our train, we have a top camera placed, and we use high-state photography and computational pixel counting to track our train as it passes by. And we also have a side camera to record rotational motion of the train if it is present. So here we see a typical graph of measured train velocity against time, and we note, firstly, that our results from our camera and our data uh, sensors are consistent, and this tells us that our tracking technique is reliable. Plus, uh, furthermore, we note that our train approaches a terminal velocity near the end of our run. So, I'll now present some key observations that's important to our theoretical formulation later on. Now, we note that reversing coil currency reverses the train direction, and this tells us that the coil currents affect the propulsion force acting on our train. And next, we note that reversing the magnetic orientation on our train also reverses the train direction, and this tells us that the driving force on our train is formed by magnetic interaction between the train's magnetic field and the coil currents. So, moving on, I'll now move on to a theoretical account of this phenomenon. I'll first go through the origin of a magnetic driving force, and then the braking force, and finally combine these forces into the overall dynamics of our train. So firstly, we will seek to model our wire coils. We can use the center helix equations, and we add a second term behind to account for the final thickness of our wire. We can write the equation for left-handed helix similarly. Now, to visualize the current flow in our system, we can visualize it as originating from our battery, going into the magnet, into the wire coil, and then back into the battery. So this allows us to write Ohm's law as such, and to calculate, the, to, to calculate the current density inside our coil. We know that in this equation, we can measure the battery internal resistance easily, and we can also calculate the distance of the wire coil through this equation. And furthermore, we know that uh, the resistance of the magnet itself is hard to calculate, because there's, current, there's curved current density inside the magnet, and also, there's also multiple contacts between the magnets and the wire coil. And therefore, we resolve the empirical characterization of our mag, the resistance, the resistance of the magnets. Here we see a measured graph of our mag against a number of parallel contacts, and we see the expected decreasing trend. We use this graph consistently in our theories for prediction. We can now uh, seek to analyze magnetic interaction between our train and the wire coil. We note that for our train, this is magnetic field produced, and for the coil, here's the coil currents. By applying the Lorentz cross product for the force on the wire coil, we're able to draw the following force vectors on the wire coil. We note that there's a net backwards force on the wire coil, and therefore by Newton's third law, there's an equal and opposite reaction force on our train, which is the origin of the driving force. Furthermore, as we let our train uh, pass through the wire coil, its magnetic field will move along with it, and so does the currents inside the coil. And this tells us that there's continuous driving force, and therefore a continuous movement of the train. Now, this mechanism also implies that if we were to flip the correlity of the coil, or to flip the magnetic orientation, the drawing force would be reversed in direction, and indeed, this is seen in our, in our observations as presented earlier. And also, interestingly, if we were to place the magnets in such a way that unlike poles face each other, then we expect that there will be no net force acting on our train because forces are symmetric and cancel out. And indeed, in our experiments, we do see that in this, for this configuration, there is no movement of the train. So, having understood the quantitative mechanism for driving force, we can now move on to quantitatively calculate it. We model our magnets as current cylinders, and we integrate the bias of our score across our geometry to obtain the following magnetic field equations. In these equations, A is the surface color magnitude, or in other words, the strength of our battery. We can then sum up the individual contributions of individual magnets to obtain the magnetic field of our train. 
We can note that the cross between the coil current density and the magnetic field of all trade to find the driving force of one or three. Now moving on, we know that moving magnetic field will induce currents in nearby conductors, and by Lenz's law, this will, this will result in an opposing force on the magnet. We therefore expect that as our train moves to the wire coil, there will be an opposing or magnetic retarding force. Now to characterize, to quantify this, we use Faraday's law, and we know that in Faraday's law, the magnetic flux is defined as a surface integral over an area bounded by the current path. Therefore, in our case, we should consider a helicoid, which is bounded by, the, by a helix. This allows us to calculate the magnetic braking force on our train as such, and we know that this force is linearly dependent on the speed of the train. Now, in summary, we have a magnetic driving force, braking force, and also friction on our train. We know that air drag is negligible, and the forces in the x and the y directions are also very small. This also that we can write the equation of motion as such, and by doing a force balance, we can write the terminal velocity of the train as such. We know that from our theory, we can calculate torque to be very small. And indeed, in our experiments, we observe no rotational motion of the train. Therefore, we can disregard rotational motion and only focus on linear motion of the train. And furthermore, we can define the power as visible driving power and write the equation as such. We can then simplify the math and note this quadratic power velocity relation. So, I'll now move on to, to uh, discuss my time domain results. Here we see a graph of measure uh, of trip velocity against time at this theoretical line. And we can see that our data matches, it, matches our lines very well. This is for two different trains with different number of minutes on each end. And we see that initially, the lighter train with only one minute on each end accelerates faster because it is more lightweight. And towards the end of the run, the, magnet, the train with, number with six minutes on each end accelerates to a higher terminal velocity. This is because it's able to produce a higher driving force. Here we see a graph of train power against time. And we see that initially the train power increases because the speed increases. However, as the train approaches terminal velocity, the net force only vanishes and therefore power decreases. We know that there's a very clear optimal point where maximum power is achieved. Now to visualize this clearer, we can plot power against velocity, and we obtain this parabolic plot, which is consistent with our theory. Indeed, we see that as we increase the number of magnets, the power increase on our train increases, which is intuitive because there's a larger driving force involved. Furthermore, we can plot power against velocity for different battery voltages. And again, we see that as we increase the battery voltage, the, the power increases. This is because battery voltage uh, is, is, results in a higher driving force. So I want to discuss the terminal velocity results of our investigation. Here we see the terminal velocity against the number of magnets. And we see that as we increase the number of magnets, there's initially an increasing trend. This is because of the increased magnetic field strength as the number of magnets is increased, therefore resulting in a higher driving force. However, at the same time, the braking force and friction also increases because of the higher mass of our train, and therefore we know that there's a plateau and a decrease of speed thereafter. Now as we plot battery voltage for, for the effect of battery voltage, you can see a linear trend between speed and battery voltage. And this is, okay, this is a bit consistent with our theory, which predicts a linear trend as well. Now here's a graph of the speed of the train against a coil diameter, and we know that this is very interesting. As we first increase the coil diameter, the increased arc length of our wire increases, and therefore there's increased resistance. This tells us that there's increased, a decreased uh, braking force on the train, and therefore an increased speed of the train. However, as we continue increasing the coil diameter to extreme values, the driving force will decrease because there's the decreasing magnetic field strength intersecting our wire coil, and this explains this decreasing part of the graph. I'm now going to discuss briefly on curved wire coils and closed loops. We know that for a curved wire coil, we can write the equation as such, where we have done a simple modification to account for the radius of curvature of our coil. And we can still apply it for the same driving force and braking force equations because these are general to any shape. But we must modify our equation of motion to account for the presence of a centripetal force. Now, but by making these changes, we're able to produce a theory that can predict the movement of a train in a closed wire coil. And we can see here that our theoretical simulation matches very well with our experiments, even for a curved wire coil. So, in conclusion, I first went through my experiment setup and I've shown you how I track my train with both sensors and camera data. And I've shown that this is a very reliable tracking technique. I've then went on to discuss magnetic interactions between our train and the wire coil and show that magnetic interaction is what drives the train. I've then went on to discuss the quantitative theory to account for both the driving force, the braking force, and the friction. And I'm able to show that my theory is consistent with reality across numerous parameters, such as coil diameter, the number of minutes on our train, and also the battery voltage. Finally, I'm also able to generalize my theory for curved wire coils and closed loops. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Professor, now we have two minutes to answer my questions.
uh, thank you reporter for your excellent report. Uh, firstly, I would like to ask, how do you measure the friction? So what we did was we placed our train inside the wire coil where we insulate it so that there is no induced current. Oh, what do you mean by insulated? We just wrap our battery in insulating tape. And then we attach a string to the end of the train and we drag it. Okay, okay, it. thank you. Uh, do you, uh, can you go to the slide 12? Slide 12, please. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, how do you uh, wind your coils? So um, I have a hidden slide for that. Um, actually, if you'll just allow me to show you. Uh, uh, what we did was that we have we bought copper wire from Okay, I would like to ask how, how do you ensure the uniformity of your coils? Um what we did was that we tried to see, so to explain it, we wound our coil on the wire mandrel on, on the iron mandrel at maximum tensity. So that like we paste the coils right next to each other. Okay. And then we space them out. I see. In the experiments. This this was a rather constant tensity. I see, okay, thank you. Uh, for your frictional force measurements, do you measure it for changing coil densities? Uh, we measure for different coils, yes. Okay, uh, how do you characterize the resistance, contact resistance versus, uh, uh, versus the parallel contacts? How do you do that? Uh, what we did was that we placed our magnets inside a wire coil, and then, so this picture will show you quite clearly how we did. Yeah, we place our magnet inside the wire coil and we measure and put we pass the current through where the battery is. Oh, I see. And, yeah. Uh, uh, can you go to the slide showing your theory? Uh, the velocity versus uh, the force of your the velocity versus time graph, please. Uh, can I ask what three parameters do you use? Uh, we have no free fitting parameters. We characterize all the parameters that are Okay, that's impressive. Yeah, uh, so for your routine, Okay, time's up. Uh, you only have four minutes to prepare your presentation.